The first order of business is the revised budget presentation. Good morning. With the passage of the assessment increase, uh, we've had to change the budget as a result of that. So here's the goal. Uh, revise the 2020 budget. Update the budget with the current information that we have available. Ensure the budget is lean. Ensure that the financial commitments that were made to the community are incorporated and kept. So if you recall, if you attended any of the presentations that I gave, that uh, it included a number of financial commitments and we've outlined that in this presentation. So if you recall also, the board in November, uh, well, they didn't approve, but they made a lot of preparations, a lot of work towards doing the fail budget and the pass budget. The fail budget was approved. That is the budget that is in place right now. Until the board takes another vote, the, the budget that is in place right now is the fail budget. But the good news is we had a, quite a bit of work already done, and we were able to access the pass budget and then combine them. Now keep in mind that we're going to have two months of fail and ten months of pass. Also, all, many of these budgets were written back in October. A lot has occurred since then, so we've learned a lot more since October, and so what we're trying to do is make sure that we incorporate that. Um, also, we wanted to make sure that the budget was lean. Okay, first off, we just mentioned that uh, the assessment increase would start on, in March. Uh, this means that uh, the assessments will be lower compared to the past budget by $364,000. Also, we've learned a lot. Remember, we wrote the budget by and large in October. And if you go back since then, we've learned a couple things. The West Side Stump Dump, to finish that work is gonna cost us $187,000. The Birdsdale uh, bridge removal is going to be 65. dollars On the positive side, there's not going to be any salary increases. That's a positive of 48. dollars um, And Birksdale North in the budget includes uh, the plan to reopen it, but to maintain it minimally, which is a savings of $49,000. So you'll see here that we have two heavy hits Two that help, but those were incorporated into the budget to make sure that we, they were as, using as current information as possible. As a result of those heavy hits, we had to make some very challenging decisions. So another thing that we learned, let me back up, another thing that we learned was that the Scottsdale Bridge, to do all that work, is going to cost $151,000 to replay, repair those bridges. Also, we have a pump that has failed at Burksdale that needs to be replaced. So if you see, if you look at those top two items, the 151, and I'm going to back up, and if you look at the West Side Stump Dump and the Burksdale Bridge, you have a large hit that we've learned about just in the last four months. So we had to make some very challenging and hard decisions. As a result, if you look at the past budget, we had to cut a number of items that were originally in the past budget that we had wanted to do, but it no longer made sense. Pickleball courts, that was a tough one. The Recreation Committee has been working on that for quite a long time. The archery range, those are items that are, the community really wants, but we had to make prudent financial decisions. Rental boat, mowers, Another one, small dog park. We originally wanted to repair the small dog park that was damaged during the storm. That has, we had to drop that. And then the sand uh, storage bins. Okay, now, and I'm gonna go into, we'll encapsulate all the financial information together in just a moment. As I mentioned at the beginning, we had several important financial commitments that needed to be met. First one, that we would effectively transfer $6 from revenue in 
outlets and golf and so forth over to assessments. And you'll see in the budget it includes a transfer of $412,000 from golf to assessments, recreation 216, lakes 150,000, and general income, which is mainly the activity card, is 64,000, and you'll see that it comes out to $842,000. Also, you'll note on the bottom that, uh, uh, and this is part of the packet that you have with you, is how long the, uh, the fee schedule will be approved for, and uh, the board is recommending at this point, they have not yet voted on any of this, but uh, that it would carry through through February 28th of 2023. All right, so there's the first financial commitment. All right, the second financial commitment is the Trafalgar Fire, okay? And this is gonna be mainly legal fees, okay? We're gonna incur, incur a lot of legal fees over the next couple years. Uh, so you'll see that we have a calculation of $280,000 in it, and that has, uh, we fulfilled that financial commitment. Next one, $4 will go towards operational costs and capital improvements for the future. So that's a little bit of a, that's a larger umbrella, where the other ones were a little bit easier, you could point to them directly. This is a little bit larger umbrella. So the revised operating budget, if you compare the failed budget to the revised operating budget, and in the packet that you have in front of you, you'll see that it includes the actuals, they're preliminary, the fail, the pass, and the revised. So we've tried to give you as much information as possible. So if you look at the revised operating budget, it includes $62,000 in additional non-capital items, okay? If we're gonna have an activity card that will allow you to use the gyms for free, you, we're gonna need more fitness equipment, okay? Recreation is gonna have to get more equipment, and so that's included in this revised budget. We have to replace a dishwasher, picnic tables, fish cleaning station, so forth. Then you go down to the revised operating budget, and you'll notice how I've underlined operating, and on the top here, you have towards operational costs. So the operating budget, if you compare the, fa the failed budget with the revised budget, it's increased by $579,000. But I wanted to point out that there's two big items in there. First is the West Side Stump Dump, and the second is the Burksdale Bridge. Okay, so those are big items that are driving that number up. Okay, so the total financial commitment is actually $994,000. You could potentially make an argument that the last two items should not be included. They're operating expenses, but you could make an argument. So that's why I specifically called those out because I didn't want anybody to go, well, the operating expenses are so much higher because of the t these two items. Okay, but you'll see even if you remove those two items, you're still well above. Next one, a dollar will go towards the reserves, okay, and that's $140,000. Now let me back up. In your packet, you'll see how we actually calculated it, okay, and you'll see that in, uh, we're basing it upon, we're estimating 14,000 improved properties that will be in good standing. How did we come up with that? We did a three-month analysis to look at what the average number of properties, improved properties, that were in good standing over a three-month period, and it came out to, uh, someone help me, 13,950, something to that nature on the packet. We wanted to have a little bit more than that. These financial commitments may, will probably increase over time because as homes get built, we'll have more improved properties. So this will be a moving number, but for right now, it's $14,000. So $14,000 times 10 months for this year times $1 is $140,000. So I wanted to explain how we, got, how we did the math. So a couple of important things. On the financial commitments, the year is not a smooth year. Our revenue goes up and down throughout the year. We, have, we bring in a lot more revenue during the summer than we do the winter, okay? So don't assume that, there is, that the financial commitments are gonna be met on this perfectly smooth line throughout the year. That's not gonna be the case. 
what is most important is that the commitments will be met by the end of the year. Also, keep in mind that budgets are forecasts. We're doing it to the best of our ability, but we can't look into the future. We do not have a crystal ball. But to our, the best of our ability, we feel confident that we will be able to meet every single financial commitment, and this budget is a good budget. So here is the, simplified ca the simple cash flow, and you'll see how we've included the fail, the pass. On this one, we did not include 2000 and, uh, uh, 2019 but in your packet you'll see that you do have that the revised and then the changes and so you'll see how revenue is going to go up with the revised with the uh, with the assessment increase you see cost of sales by and large stays the same expenses change we talked about it, that quite a bit in the presentation and then you start getting down to here here are those changes we talked about the reductions from the capital budget, the additions, and the, and the subtractions and everything. And then you have the emergency reserve. So here's the emergency reserve, $140,000. You'll see in the past budget, we had assigned $200,000. Well, this was a tight budget. And because of those additional expenses that we found out about over the last few months, we realized that we couldn't quite make that uh, commitment. It also includes $280,000 that will go towards the paying off the water loan. Now paying off the water loan is not one of the financial commitments that was included in the 2020 plan, but it has been a concern of the board and they wanted to pay this off. How did we come up with $280,000? Well, if you take the $335,000 that's included in the past budget and you make it 10 months instead of 12 months, that's how you get to the 280. Okay. So the bottom line squeaks over the line at a positive cash flow of $4,000. Okay. But we had to really, really tighten up our belt to get even to that point. And here is uh, the uh, simple cash flow for the water department. And you'll see that that is fairly similar. Uh, a, a little bit of a change, but not too much of a change. To recap our goals, we wanted to revise the 2020 budget. Keep in mind, the current budget that is in place is the fail budget. Until the board takes another vote, the fail budget is the budget. Um, we wanted to make sure we, we, uh, when we wrote the 2020 revise that we incorporated any new information that we learned along the way, and we've learned a lot. Unfortunately, most of it has been very expensive. Uh, have a lean budget. And most importantly, ensure that the financial commitments that were made to the community on the 2020 plan are incorporated into this budget. That's the end of my presentation. Any questions? No questions. That's good. Next item the approval of the 2020 plan fee schedule. Mind if I jump in there? Sure, go ahead. On page 33 of your board packet, you'll see the revised fee schedule, and then right after that on page 35, you'll actually see a draft version of the schedule. But returning back to 33, there was a discussion at the last board meeting regarding how long this, uh, this uh, 2020 plan fee schedule should be in place. Should it be in place through the end of 20, 2022 or should it be in place for three years? We looked at, at all the documentation, all the marketing material that was put out and all the marketing material that was distributed stated 2022. But it's an understandable confusion simply because we had the first vote where it was a clean one where it would have started on January 1, and then the second vote where it, the rate increase would kick in on March 1. So it was a, a, a completely understandable that what people would say three years versus the end of 2022. With that being said, since it's an understandable uh, misconception, management is recommending that uh, the fee schedule remain in place 
through February 28th, 2023. That'll be a full three years. Uh, and make sure that if anybody was uh, misunderstood that at all, it would make sure that we fulfilled their obligation also. I also want to note, you'll see on the bottom of page 35 a note, not every fee is covered in the 2020 plan. The 2020 plan didn't include in, uh, fees such as blowing springs, kayak rentals, and so forth. So the moratorium where there is no increase in fees does not apply to those. Those may, may or may not change. Uh, it only applies to golf fees, recreation fees, lake use fees, those types of things. So I wanted to make sure we called that out because a year from now, if we decide that it makes sense to increase, let's say, Blowing Springs, the fees at Blowing Springs, we wanted to make sure that nobody misunderstood and thought that those fees could not be increased. Any comments or discussion? Oh, Jerry. I find really that it's a little bit confusing to figure out what is the 2020 fee schedule and what is the 2020 uh, fee plan schedule. Uh, maybe I misspoke on those terms, but there's actually two different fee schedules. Uh, one is what's included in the 2020 plan and one what is included on the fee schedule. And which one of these are we actually going to vote on? Good question. So the 2020, the marketing piece that was used for the 2020 plan, it included uh, all the fees for golf, for recreation, for lake use, for gun range and so forth. All of those fees in that marketing piece are included in the fee schedule. This fee schedule is consistent with the format that we've used for a number of years. The only thing that has changed is that the rates have changed and they are 100% in line which was, which, with what was presented in the 2020 plan marketing material for the assessment increase. Does that make sense? So you're only voting on this fee schedule. Uh, if we use your suggested motions, which there are two, we're voting on one schedule and then on a separate schedule. Is that correct? You're talking about you page 34? Correct. You are correct. You're, you're, you're effectively voting on, yes, you are correct 100%. Okay. Next question and then I'm done. Uh, under recreation, it says RV Park Campground. Go over to the last column, guest of members only. Is that what we really intend? No, we included, we made, I apologize, we made that correction, uh, and this is, a, this is an older version. That uh, should be under uh, Kingsdale, uh, where the tennis is. Uh, we will have that correction made by uh, next week, but this is, an, this is a slightly older version. David Brandenburg had pointed that out uh, at one of the last meetings. Okay, I'm sorry, I misspoke. And I have one more question. <clears throat> and that includes the Blowing Springs area. Uh, when we look at the uh, different schedules and so on, uh, including the campground, what about when uh, it, it's also included as far as part of the trails, trailhead, using the same parking lots that the pavilion uses and the tinters use and even some of the RV campers, uh, extra vehicles, those sorts of things. We also have, uh, unless we're eliminating those, the music concerts, uh, and other uses of that park. They get it. Eliminating anybody that's not a guest of the member. So that actually was brought up uh, in an email that uh, Director McKee sent out a couple days ago in making sure that we're clear on what 
parks are open to the public and what parks are for member use, member and their guests, guests that have cards, uh, guest cards with them. And Blowing Springs is not one of the parks that is limited to members only. Okay, but where my question comes in, combining all those uses and in particular the music festivals, uh, those parking lots and even the grass areas are completely full. Now, maybe this should hold off until we get to the trailheads. Uh, but if we've also got people using that parking lot as a trailhead, then there's people that are displaced someplace. Where are we going to displace them to? So I would say this, and this may be uh, more relevant to the trailhead discussion. Um, Thank you. Um, is that um, majority of the time when uh, people are using, we, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. If you're accessing the greenway, which terminates at just prior to the entrance of Blowing Springs Park, we utilize that parking lot there. We don't allow those that are going to use that trail to go into the park to park except on special events. When we have large special events such as uh, the, uh, the flea in the park and so forth, yes, we have a, a, an abundance of, abundant number of people that want to use our amenities and typically what we do in those cases is we contact Cooper communities and they allow us to use some of their land uh, adjacent or across the street from the um, uh, the, the pet hospital, the, the veterinary. Okay, I, I'm willing to hold that further discussion until we get to the trailheads. Okay. That moves along. Then we are moving to the Blowing Springs connector. Limited terminable license agreement. Okay. Is this working well? Okay, it sounds like it's working well. So keep in mind uh, these presentations we put together to make it as clear as possible uh, for people to fully understand all these different uh, issues that are. We're, talking about today, whether it's the budget, the Blowing Springs connector, the wake boat issue, we wanted to make it as clear as possible. If you attend next Thursday's meeting, you'll notice that a lot of these slides will be pretty much consistent unless there's changes made as a result of budget, uh, board comments today. So let's talk about the uh, Blowing Springs connector agreement. Uh, concept, develop a three mile connector that will service uh, the east side residents uh, kids from Cooper Elementary would potentially be able to safely ride their bikes to school. Uh, it would be possible to ride from Metfield Park all the way to Fayetteville, which is uh, about a 40 mile ride on a 10 foot wide concrete path. Background. So I wanted to make sure that we gave you a, a good history on all the things that have occurred that have led up to the Blowing Springs Connector. So this corridor was discussed uh, way back in early 2000s. Uh, the Recreation Committee, we actually received an email from a uh, former uh, chair of the Recreation Committee that was on the committee of over 10 years ago and commented how uh, they were discussing this exact trail area over 10 years ago. Uh, the first Bella Vista Trail Master Plan showed this connector back in 2010. The POA sponsored a meeting for the community to solicit input in December of 13. Uh, if you remember the old Village Voice uh, pamphlets that would go out on a quarterly basis years and years ago, there's actually an article about this exact trail. The regional Walk bike plan was adopted by city council in 14. While it doesn't necessarily relate to the POA, it's still a public forum that community members could have spoken at. 
Uh, the POA sponsored a meeting held in June of 14. Once again, this was covered in the Village Voice that was mailed out to all property owners. Uh, the POA sponsored another meeting. Uh, it was mainly a recap meeting. Charlie, I think you were in attendance. Um, in fact, I think you were the one that led the meeting uh, in March of 15. Uh, the proposed corridor was included in an article uh, that, was in, uh, that was sent out to all property owners March 16, and that, uh, it, that article included a map with that connector on it. Uh, and then we, most recently, we had a community input meeting at Cooper Elementary in March of, seven, uh, of 19. And then finally, uh, the city has voted on this agreement in January 2020. So many of these agreements where the POA and the city are partnering on an issue, the city and the POA both independently have to vote on it, okay? And it doesn't have to be one before the other. It could be the other, you know, it does not, there's no protocol for one has to take precedence. So what you'll see today is for the Blowing Springs connector, the POA is, is potentially gonna vote second on this one uh, where on the trailhead, we would be the ones that vote first and the city would vote second. But there's no, it does not matter which one goes first or second. So there's a little bit of a ba background on everything that has taken place. Here's the connector. Uh, so to orient you a little bit, here's the soccer fields in Cooper Elementary School. And here is Blowing Springs Park. And you'll notice that it connects all the way up there. Um, if you uh, know that uh, the Blowing Springs connector, which goes, the portion that goes right by the school was completed several months ago. Jerry, this is the parking lot that I was referencing just a few moments ago where they park most of the time. And then so this will connect to that end of that trail and go all the way up to Metfield Park. It's uh, 2.9 miles and Okay, so back in March of 19, we had a number of, uh, we had a, a meeting, it was well attended, and there was a number of issues that came up uh, where people voiced concern about one thing or, an, or another, and here's some of the changes that were made as a result of that meeting. First of all, uh, drainage was improved along Euston. A lot of people were concerned about that. Um, in many locations, uh, the connector was moved further away from the road. People were concerned about traffic speeds and so forth, so it was moved further away from the road. Um, the number of crosswalks, if you recall, if you were at that meeting way back when, uh, there were some areas where they had multiple crosswalks on the same road in a very short amount of uh, space. What they did was they came through and they um, uh, reduce the number of crosswalks and combine them together where the soft surface and the connector trail, the concrete trail, use the same crosswalk. And the next one was they wanted to make sure uh, there was a lot of concern about compliance. Now keep in mind that this trail, this connector, actually has to fall under AASHTO, and I don't know what the uh, an acronym stands for, but you can look it up. AASHTO is different from ADA. Uh, but a lot of people wanted to make sure that it was compliant. So now here's, here's why is AASHTO different? AASHTO allows you to follow the slope of the road. Okay, so if you th imagine yourself in Bentonville or Rogers or Fayetteville, there are roads that are quite steep and the sidewalk that's right next to them are not ADA compliant. Uh, I imagine that there's quite a number of roads in uh, San Francisco that are not ADA compliant or sidewalks. Um, but they wanted to get as close as possible, even though that's not the, the, the regulation that they must adhere to, they wanted to get as close as possible. So of the three miles, it's actually 2.9 miles, there's only 200 feet of the connector that are above 5% grade. So they actually did what I've been told is it's pretty much an engineering marvel that they were able to get, I mean, imagine in Bella Vista, over a 2.9 mile stretch to have only 200 feet over a 5% grade. That's pretty amazing with the amount of hills that we have in this area. Also regarding speed limits, uh, they spoke with the city uh, about potentially lowering the speed limit in that area. 
All right, details. Goes from Blowing Springs Park all the way up to Metfield Park, 2.9 miles, 10 foot wide. Uh, most of the connector uh, is on the side uh, by Houston. Um, this will connect into the Razorback Greenway, which would allow you to go all the way down to Fayetteville. Um, if approved, the estimated completion is the fourth quarter of this year, uh, and no added maintenance costs for the connector, but the city will need to continue to mow along Eusted in those areas. They'll just have to not mow over the path or the connector. Okay. Amendment. Okay, so in your packet, you actually have the agreement that was signed by the city, okay, or approved by the city. Uh, one of our directors, Dr. Hover, brought to our attention, well, what about e-bikes. So back in, correct me, in 17, the state, Arkansas, changed the regulation regarding e-bikes and created three classes, class one, two, and three, and I'm only going to state the first one because that's the most important one. It must, the bike must be pedal assisted, okay, so you can't, it's not a moped. Uh, it can't be a combustion engine. It must be electric and it must cease giving you assistance once you hit 20 miles an hour, otherwise known as an e-bike, okay? And they're allowing those bikes on the trail. So uh, my wife and I were walking uh, up by uh, um, uh, Crystal Bridges a couple weeks ago when it was warm, and here goes a guy on the trail, on the greenway, on a class one e-bike, and he's trailing a kid behind him. And he's hardly pedaling, you know, he's pedaling, but not that much for that much weight behind him. Uh, so it is allowed. So uh, the city, what the city is doing is, in speaking with the mayor, what happens is the state will pass a new code, new ordinance, new statute, and that will then trickle down to all the cities, and they'll have to make modifications to their rules, to their, their governance. Okay, so that's what they're doing right now. If you were at the city's most recent meeting, they were actually talking about it. They've already drawn up the documentation. Okay, so what we're proposing, and many people that were on the re that are on the re rules and regulations committee have not seen this because this is a recent development. Okay, this amendment to the connector agreement would then allow class one e-bikes on it. As I indicated, pedal assisted, you still have to put effort into it. Uh, and no assistance over 20 miles an hour. And the class two and class three, oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed an extra uh, mark on that. That should say class two and three. Um, those are not allowed, those are pretty much non-pedal assisted or they go faster than 20 miles an hour. Those are not allowed. Okay, so what we're proposing is that if the board so chooses, uh, when the vote would be taken, you would approve the agreement, okay, on the connector, and then you would approve the amendment at the same time. The amendment would then go to the city, and the city would, um, would uh, approve that, probably in conjunction with their uh, updating their ordinance regarding e-bikes. And once again, to the Re Rules and Regulations Committee, apologize, you have not seen this, but this was a recent re revelation. Uh, I received the email from the mayor just a few days ago regarding the ordinance change. And Tom, once, uh, once the city ordinance is passed, that would necessitate a policy change as well for rules and regs to update the policy to coincide with a new ordinance. Gary wants to go ahead. Uh, exactly where to start on this, I don't know. I, the last several days in particular, uh, I think most of us have received a number of uh, requests from various POA members uh, to approve the connector agreement probably in the neighborhood of uh, myself, maybe one no to seven or eight positives. Um, unfortunately, uh, 
I may have to vote against it, and I need to explain why. And I need to ask some additional questions concerning it. Um, the agreement itself uh, appears to me, and I know I am not a lawyer, I do not intend to try to be a lawyer, but I do have a background in trails of some 25 years of administering the Federal Recreational Trails Act to the sum of about $3 million per year. So I have some knowledge of what is required. I have to disagree with the management on part of it in that the uh, Shito uh, that he references is for federal highways, city highways, with bicycle trails immediately on the edge of the, tra uh, the road. Okay, it does not cover the current trail that we're proposing. Okay, one amendment that I will make uh, if this moves on further, and that is that it must meet all ADA, current ADA standards. Okay, the current document leaves that up to opinions as to what are applicable laws. Okay, and in my opinion, they have chosen the wrong one. Uh, I don't very often go against what management is proposing, but I don't believe that it is the right thing to do. I think we need to do the right thing and that is for all of our members. If only 200 feet doesn't meet the 5% grade, then it can surely, with today's uh, engineering and today's equipment, it can meet that. So, um, I only got the pictures last night, so I didn't really have time to go through all of them. Uh, first of all, uh, where is the Little Sugar Trailhead? Exactly how about we try the, how we how about we cover that in just a moment when we go over the trailhead agreement? Okay. Is that all right? All right. That's fine. Um, okay, exhibit B says GPS plus forty feet. Twenty feet either side of the center line. Okay. Not knowing exactly where that center line is. I question whether or not we have a 40-foot easement. Uh, I call it an easement because essentially that's what it is. Uh, it may be legally some other term, but that's 40-foot wide strip. And I question that we have that much room in there. Uh, okay, it also allows for, once we sign all the agreements and they get ready, they start building and so on, that they can change those GPSs. So in other words, they can move that corridor you know, back and forth or whatever. I don't think that should be allowed. We should have enough engineering expertise to place it in the first place rather than allow them to, I mean, if they can move within that corridor, that's not a problem. But the way it reads is they can move the entire corridor. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, under item six, it says the uh, lessor and the lessee cannot charge a fee, but a third party, it doesn't state that, but a third party has in the past and would be able to charge a fee. Okay, I don't think that is correct, or if we do allow that, then at least whatever the fee is, that a percentage of that, an equal percentage, goes to the city and goes to the POA. Okay. Uh, there is a portion of the new connector, and maybe it's not a part of the connector, but it's a piece that's required in order to reach from the trail 
the current greenway to the new greenway that is to be maintained by the POA. We stated in our 2020 plan, no new trail maintenance fees. Am I correct? We are not, we are, there are not, there is not a financial commitment. We are not having to assign, for example, on the back 40, we have $35,000 a year. Yes. On the Little Sugar, we have to assign yes. $35,000 a year. For this tr entire trail, there is no annual commitment. So you're going to take fees, money from the current trails to maintain this portion, is that correct? No, because that area is brush area. It's not maintained. I mean, we maintain along the side already, and then it goes into the brush area, which is not maintained at this time. So we're going to maintain what we're currently maintaining, and we will not maintain what we are currently not maintaining, because where the trail is going, it's not requiring that. That's part of the problem of not knowing where the trail is going. <clears throat> because the parcel maps, I mean, there are huge parcels. And the way if we agree to this, that any place in that entire parcel they could use to put the trail or parking lot or trailhead. Well, I can show you the exact plans that have been developed by the engineer. It's a very large file, but I can show you and it shows exactly where the trail goes but yet they can still move that. So Doug, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that may go back to uh, the soft surface trail. Yeah, it was, this, was, this was developed from the same template that the soft surface trails were um, in, put in place. And the main reason was once they get on the ground in those locations, you know, they, they have an idea where they want to put the trail, but they get there and there's a, you know some impediment that they have to go around so um, the idea was to to work with management where they're placing the trails and then um, come back and say this is where it is it's within the 20 20 foot either side of that midpoint so it was based off of that same template um, and like Tom said that the plans have been developed for a specific location where it's where it's going to be placed but um, it, it was based off of that that reasoning that for the soft surface trails there were lots of areas where they'd have to reroute the trail from where they initially intended okay I want to make very clear uh, the agreement requires the POA to maintain the parcel 16-43407 to parcel 16-2774-000. And we are not going to spend any additional dollars on that maintenance. No. Nope. So those, those parcels were identified that go from the beginning of Blowing Springs up through the end of Blowing Springs and up to Manchester. And as Tom mentioned, those areas are already mowed. They're already maintained as part of the blowing, uh, as part of Blowing Springs campground and uh, the entrance to Blowing Springs. So, so that portion of the trail or connector that the POA is responsible for is already being maintained uh, because, of, because of its location in the, in the, in the park. So um, you know, if, a, if a tree fell, I think someone mentioned, well, what happens if a tree falls? Are you going to take it out? Well. It would have been taken out regardless because that's already areas that's maintained by the POA. For where the arboretum is at the uh, tail end of Blowing Springs Park, that grassy area is mowed. mowed. The trail will go in that area. It will still be mowed. It's currently being mowed. Will be mowed in the future. Okay. Uh, there's at least one person. And there's been several others comment about it, and I haven't seen any reference to lighting. That person believes that the trail will be lighted. Is that true or not true? We've never discussed lighting. Never heard anything about lighting. If there are street lights, I suppose it'll be lighted in that area, but. <clears throat> okay. Just wanted an answer. <clears throat> 
Okay, I had some other questions on trailheads, but that's all I have on trails. I just want to echo a lot of the things that Jerry said. They're concerns that I have too, and I know we addressed a lot of them in that PowerPoint there, but I still feel like I would like to see more detail put into this agreement than we currently are right now. I would like it written. I know you've said it and we've all said it a thousand times. We're not going to have any additional expenses. I would like that in the agreement. Completely solidly written that we are not expending any more money that if something happens it falls to the city to fix anything that happens along this trail because it should not fall on us. And um, actually the light poles was one I had a question about when we had that March 2019 meeting and we discussed this a couple weeks ago, members had a lot of concerns. I mean, they came out, they voiced their opinion, they asked questions and I have yet to see until today those questions answered. I know they've been addressed by the trailblazers. I know they've been addressed by a lot of groups building this trail, but I really would like to see and show the membership that they have been taken into consideration and changes have been made and where they've been made and it will be lighted, it will be safe, it, where it did move away from the road. Just a detailed answer to those questions because I feel like maybe there's some we missed. I can't remember back a year ago what those questions were, but I know somebody there was typing them all up. And I think we addressed those. And we had those, the, all those issues on our website for six months. And according to Google Analytics, one or two people pulled it up. It was available. Can you send that to me? I, huh? I, have, not, I have not seen that. No, it was on the POA's website. Their questions? All the comments that were made during it, during that meeting, we had it on our website for six months. But I want the answers to those comments. Yeah, not just the questions. I understand that. Um, and those are the, you know, I presented the concerns that, that they felt that they could address. Um, you know, the lighting one that you just mentioned, lighting has never been approached and, and I think that we have to be careful when it comes to lighting, simply because where one person wants lighting, other people don't want lighting. Uh, and keep in mind that there are homes on the top of the ridge by Blowing Springs. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I can, Anyway, that's why I included it in this presentation. Okay. I really, really want this to move forward. I think this connector is fantastic for our community. But the two things that are still sticking in my head is I would like to see the maintenance amendment added into that agreement. And I, I'm with Jerry and a couple other members on this board that how can we make it ADA compliant? What can we do to get to that point and what is it that completely stops us if it's not possible? I just would like more detail so that I'm prepared to make a decision. Because as of right now, I don't want to approve this agreement, but I really want this connector. So let's find a way to just those details to get it perfect, to get it moving forward. Mm -hmm. And the board received this agreement, a draft version in, in January. It would have been it would have been good to have these comments back then to be fair I've been making the maintenance one since day one Jerry yeah I have to agree there's been a lot of comments made by board members over this period of time so um, but I want to make it very clear to the board as well as to the audience that I am very much in favor of the connector I think it's something that we need. It's something that's been asked for, for a num by a number of people for a number of years. As you can see, it went back to 14. Uh, the only problem is we need to do it right, not just halfway. Steve? Right, um, on the maintenance issue, there people talk about blowing springs, but there's two or three parcels that go south of Blowing Springs all the way down to Little Sugar Shopping Center and as well as abut um, Burksdale South. We're not going into Burksdale South at this point, but um, those are parcels that are not currently maintained. I believe most of it is Cooper land. I can't believe we're, are we, we're not maintaining Cooper land already. So if we put a trail there, so I just wanted to point that out. I agree on the ADA compliance it needs to be full. Um, one other issue, at least in my mind, is still the liability up there at, uh, up at Brittany. I know we've talked about it, but um, there just seems to still be some questions out there. So, 
Well, I, I, on that, I want to make sure that, so David, you can jump in here, but uh, uh, David Welchel is, is a uh, uh, well-respected golf course architect, and we've met, and David has uh, met with uh, Aaron and myself multiple times regarding this, and adjustments were made to the original plans to accommodate David's concerns. So David, maybe you could speak to this. Well, you know, I've got a couple things I'm going to comments I'm going to make here. We'll talk about the safety issue first. I don't see it as a safety issue in that particular area. What we did was ask them to move that path outside of what is typically known as the zone of danger in golf course design. Now, that does not mean a golf ball would never go over there because you can't predict, and we have a lot of golfers on this board. Uh, very few of the golfers outside of the professional golfers know exactly where their ball is going all the time. So you can't say that one will never go over there. We just use the best judgment that we can, the data that we have uh, available to us. 92% uh, of all golf balls land within a 15 degree angle of the intended line of play. And that's, uh, that's something that's defensible in court. Uh, it, has, it has been challenged many times. Sure, there are, could be extenuating circumstances, but that's what we used in order to get that trail moved. Actually, it was inside that hole on, on Brittany. Two, hole three, what was it, Jimmy? Two. Hole two. Um, and we made him move it back out closer to the road. So uh, having, that's, that's, I don't have any concerns about the safety of it there. Uh, there are places, you know, that are worse around this community. These golf courses were built at a time when, when the corridors were very, very, very narrow. Jimmy knows this, and today, uh, we have to build golf courses that have a 400 foot wide corridor from property line to property line. Most of these are 200 to 250 feet. And even in that area where it's very tight, we still had room for it. Okay, while I have the floor, I'm, I'm gonna go back. I, I have a question because I'm, I'm not as concerned about the ADA uh, com uh, compliance of this as some of you are. In the Razorback Greenway, is the entire Greenway, and this may have no bearing on what we're building, so hang on a minute, Jerry. Uh, is the entire Razorback Greenway ADA compliant? Do we know that? Do we have any idea? I've ridden probably 35 of the 40 miles, and there's our, there are sections in Bentonville by, by uh, um, Crystal Bridges. There are sections in uh, Rogers by the Coca-Cola building. And there are sections going into Fayetteville that are not close to being ADA compliant. The biggest one would be when you go from Slaughter Pen up to Crystal Bridges. Mm -hmm. That's a heck of a that's a tough ride up. Yeah. Um, it's a ten percent grade. Yeah, that's a ten percent grade. So and then that 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 begs another question here is that uh, are we bound by ADA requirements on that or AASHTO, which is the American Association of state highways and whatever, they write the rules for, for highways and sidewalks. So are we bound by that or are we bound by ADA? Now, I've worked with ADA for many years. I wrote some of the early laws for how golf courses are supposed to uh, adhere to the ADA requirements. ADAG was, I was on the board. I was in, their, I was in their first group in 1993 writing that. And we did everything we could to make sure golf courses are as accessible as possible. And now there are laws out there that state that you have to do things like that. But I don't know, I don't know what, what this applies to, whether it's ADA or AASHTO or the Arkansas State Highway Commission or the city regs and rules. And so I'm not really concerned about it. If it's, if it's not over the anything that they have on the greenway, why? Why worry about it? Well, l let me jump in. So what I've been told consistently is that it must adhere to AASHTO standards. And keep in mind that the city has approved the agreement and they have approved the location and the grades and so forth. The city is the one that would enforce the ADA and they are approving it. Uh, just a comment. Uh Someone ahead of you runs a stop sign. Does that make it legal for you to run a stop sign? What does that have to do with anything, It has to do the same thing with. Just because maybe Rogers, Benville, somewhere else doesn't meet ADA fully, 
that doesn't mean that we don't have to. We have to do the right thing, which is ADA. So, Jerry, I did not say that. What I said was it doesn't concern me as much as it does you. We don't, we don't have to do it just because it's the right thing. Sure, if we can. It may, it may be something, and that's why I think Ashto is written that way. There are places that you just can't physically engineering do it at a cost-effective manner. It may even cost prohibitive. Sure, I'd like to be able to do all that. I don't have a problem. It's like making sure that our, our, all our buildings are ADA compliant. But I, and, uh, there are times when you just can't do it. Now, do we know that at this particular location? I don't know. I don't know what the, the grades are there. I'd like to see what those are just so that I know. Maybe it's 7%, that 200 feet. You know, if there's places out there that are 10%, then you're getting pretty steep. But they, they build them in uh, roads all the time. That's not ADA compliant, so just give me a second here. But I'd like to see what it is, 7%, because the ADA requirement is 5%. It's a 20 to 1 slope. I'd like to see what it is and see, you know, maybe you can do something to, to get it a little closer. But like I said, it, it, I know I'd like to do it. Maybe we just can't. Okay, Mary, would you like to weigh in? Well, I agree with Tom. But I Microphone. Written, I've written the Greenway. Okay. Um, not quite as far down to Fayetteville as he is, but there are certainly areas there where the slope is much greater than 5%. And I guess if, if those were approved by the ADA, well, we don't know that, whether they were or not. If they were approved by the ADA, then I think we're okay to go. Okay, we're, we're talking about a 200 foot roughly section at the intersection of Houston Road and Commonwealth. 200 any, feet. Has anybody asked Aaron what his take is on this? Aaron has uh, say, stated a number of times. First of all, they took the original concept and made it much more ADA accessible since the original. But they felt that they got into certain areas where it was not reasonable. One of the areas is by Brittany Golf Course where we have the larger rise. So David, your reference to in certain areas we can't do it. Well, we're concerned about keeping that path far enough away so we can't do a switchback in that area. That wouldn't work. Um, or then we, be, then we would potentially be inside that 15 uh, percent degree of deflection. Uh, so, but what they've been saying over and over again is ashto that's the standard that they have to live under yeah i a um, couple of points on the uh liability thing the um I, and i think there's some confusion on different levels that this is in fact a trail it's not just a i mean it's concrete but even the city of fayetteville says a trail with a hard surface or concrete or soft surface it's a trail so um, I think we need to be very clear about that the other thing is uh, it seems to me that uh, the east side of Houston may be a, a choice here as well and uh, I'd like to see that that potential explored as well Jerry I'm for the trails, but I do have issues with the uh, 200 square feet. They got 5% slope. I, I think they could come up with a compromise on that. My main concern is, is that level all the way through. The up and down forward motion and backward motion, I'm not really worried about as they walk down the trails. I am worried about the slope to the sides more than anything else. And Jerry, I, I, you, you'd expressed that concern to me. Well, I actually expressed it to David. David told me about it. And I checked, and uh, it has a 1% grade left to right, okay, uh, enough so. to, to shed water into the closest drainage area. If it was completely flat, you'd have potentially standing water, which wouldn't be good. Uh, they can go up to a 2% grade, uh, but they, they typically shoot for a 1% grade. Okay, well, I'm good with the 1%. Jim? A um, couple of comments. One, uh, 
uh, Bella Vista has a half mile of sidewalks and they are four feet wide and we have 660 miles of roads. I mean, this, the only sidewalk we have is right down below us, the new subdivision. So we have zero paved sidewalks. And because of that, I'm just hugely in favor of this. Um, one little comment you made, I would prefer that the actual 40 foot corridor be set as built because they may hit rock on certain parts or they may be able to not cut apart or cut it deeper and then we establish the as-built easement later and you know you've done that many times in your business too rather than prescribe it according to the design because the field uh, drawing the field work will change the design a little bit so I'd like to see it the other way from what you wanted a fixed right or a fixed easement but uh, I think this is a you know, we have one, uh, one routing, but it's in Bentonville. It's around Lake Bella Vista. Some of it's uh, asphalt, some of it's uh, concrete, and it's about, what, a couple miles. And it's extremely level, but it's, it's Bentonville, but we get to use it too. Uh, the Branchwood paved path is major up and down, so you, we can't call that a even a sidewalk per se, but it's, it's heavily used. So anyway, these grades will be the best that we could ever do in Bella Vista, considering the terrain in Bella Vista. I can't think of another reach that's that gentle in slope. So like David said, we may not quite hit ADA, but we're gonna be close. And it's gonna be extremely walkable, so. Okay, everybody's weighed in. Um, it'll move forward to next Thursday. <clears throat> and um, we'll see what happens. Next on the agenda is trailheads. Sure. You want Keith? Yeah, he's coming up right now. Okay. Keith is going to talk to us oh, about I'm sorry. the Birchdale Bridges. I apologize. And we'll let can, him. Can you hold off? I didn't realize that we had one more item. I apologize. That may be another hour. Okay, we're going to talk about the trailheads. Um, we have a listing. We had questions about the size of them, and I think Tom has something. Okay, so the concept is to have a, a trailhead agreement. Uh, there are multiple trailheads on the back 40 and on Little Sugar. Uh, if this agreement is approved by the board, it would still need to be uh, approved by the city. Uh, no additional maintenance cost. In many cases, we're already maintaining these trailheads, uh, or at least the ones that are on POA property. And these would fall under the, the $35,000 that is spent on the uh, uh, back 40 and the $35,000 on the uh, little sugar section. Here is a list of all the trailheads and you'll notice that many of these or some of these are not on POA property, but we wanted to include a list of every single one that there are. Uh, you'll notice we have uh, right here, we have the Assembly of God trailhead, uh, the city streets department, the historic water, uh, this community church, those are just a few of them that are not on POA property. I wanted to point that out. I, I think the other thing that's important to point out is having sufficient parking for people is important. Uh, if we don't have sufficient parking, they're going to find their own place to park. Uh, whether they should or shouldn't, they're going to do it. Uh, so uh, we have to have sufficient parking uh, for people. And here is a map. Now this is just the little sugar section. Uh, so on the right hand side of the map in red, that's, that's uh, the back 40. Uh, here's the highway. Uh, and then here's the little sugar in green. And you'll see the, the uh, seven uh, pin marks, six or seven, seven pin marks of the general location uh, of where those trailheads would be. And in the packet uh, that was handed out, you'll see all of the locations, or at least 
the parcels that are indicated on this. So this agreement would cover both sides, um, uh, both Little Sugar and Back 40 trailheads all in one. As Tom said, some of these trailheads are in existence and some of them are uh, yet to be constructed. Comments, questions? Who's cost? Who's cost to construct? We're not building them. We're not building them. All these, so the uh, cost to construct is part of the uh, grant uh, to build the uh, Little Sugar. And it was also included in the construction of um, the Back 40. Does that need to be included here in this agreement about no. who's paying? I don't think so. Uh, no, because it would be covered. You, you, this is a you. Yeah, it would be covered under the, under the construction license. There's no, there's no financial commitment at all there for the POA. Because I don't recall any listing in the original trail license <coughs> specifically Listed. about the uh, trailheads. Listing it's of. about building trails, but I don't recall anything about building the actual trailheads as well. Yeah, and, and there's, I mean, I yeah, don't. there's there's no cost associated with it. It doesn't, it doesn't talk about cost in the agreement at all, so they wouldn't be able to, to charge us for trailheads with, without a specific cost associated with it in the agreement. Okay. The ones that don't already exist, are they going to be gravel or hard surface? Uh, gravel. That's interesting because the archery group was told they had to have a paved parking lot. So, anyhow. Uh, let me uh, hold on, Jerry. Um, they, it's paved for the handicap spot. So if a archery parking lot was built, we would have to have handicap parking. That would be required to be paved. Yeah. Similar, like at the gun range, if you go to the gun range, we have an area that is paved for handicap parking and then everything else is gravel. That was just not made clear to the group. I'm sorry. Uh, questions that I have. Uh, does the city or POA or anyone have any kind of cooperative agreements with the other private properties? In other words, like the Assembly of God, the church, and so on. Um, what uh, happened? What, let me finish, please. What happens when, say, a Sunday or whenever church service is in place, the parking lot's full, uh, or that bike people have taken spots from the parking lot and the church people have no place to park or have to park elsewhere. What happens then without a cooperative agreement? What happens when uh, there becomes litter? Is that bike people that cause the litter? Is it church people that cause the litter? Who is maintaining that parking lot and cleaning up the litter, those kinds of things? Those questions to me have not been answered. What I've been told is there are separate agreements with the specific entity. I was, I was told that there is no separate agreements. So one of us is not correct. I can find out. Thank you. Okay. Exhibit A is not true. States right up at the top. Just look at Exhibit A. I don't even have to say it. Very top of it. What page is that, Jerry? Yeah, I'll fix that. It's page 53. Yeah, I'll fix that. It says parcels owned by licensor, so there are several here, as, as Tom mentioned, that aren't actually owned by, by the POA, so I will, I will fix that. While you're fixing it, I believe one of the parcels is also missed. I changed that already. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I, I think the... Uh, At least uh, I changed okay. the one that I saw. Hopefully it's the same one that you saw. I'll ask you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm fine. I thought we had missed the community church one. I don't see mm -hmm. it in the exhibit, but it is on the listing, so. Yeah. Uh, 
question, probably. Um, looking at Blowing Springs North Trailhead. And that is, if I don't have a page number on it, uh, it's second to the last page. It looks to me like the red circular square. Um, covers the existing parking lot. Is that correct? Yes, that's the that's the existing parking lot there at the very back of Blowing Springs. Okay. That brings me to my question I had earlier. Um, when there's a music group, as an example, want to come in, right now there's not even enough parking, and many times they've been even going into the Arboretum to park. Okay, now we add additional bikes people to that parking lot. I have problems with doing that kind of a thing. Well, we would be able to control access since they'd have to go through the uh, gate area. So in those kind of instances, we would in all probability block it. And are you coming for the concert? Are you coming for mountain biking? Something to that nature. Okay. That, but that's not permitted. We can't restrict access. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> when are you going to shut that off to bikers? Early morning? Some of them could be there all day. Many of them are going to come in late afternoon before the concert starts before people start coming in. Are you going to keep them out then? I'm just uh, offering a possible solution. It wouldn't be any different than when we do uh, not flee in the park, but fireflies. tailgates and fireflies when we restricted and asked, hey, what are you here for? Oh, if you're just here to come to the picnic, we're busy right now. We're using that. We've done that. Mm -hmm. Right, and we've closed the park for uh, weddings, and we've closed it for other special events. Closed it totally to, except for the booked event yeah. many times I have, I have been to many many of the concerts there and it has never been closed never we, we, so have, had, to, we, we have had weddings where we shut it down right. the back park wedding is not a concert okay um, Probably what I'm going to do uh, is next week is make a motion to uh, table this issue. Um, just I don't I don't like surprises. I don't want the board to have surprises, so I think they need to know what I probably will do. Um, like I say, I want this all to to pass and to be there, but I can't allow myself to vote for something that has. Um, many different kinds of errors and, and not doing the right thing to do. On the uh, point I was making, it's under the uh, section 13. It says you, we will not disturb, damage, or restrict access during the term of the license. So we can't, if we say you can park here, it doesn't matter what else is going on, a wedding or a funeral, what have you, we cannot per this agreement. I so think as a practical matter, you find if a parking lot is full, you have to park someplace else. I mean, it's that's, pretty much that's first come, issue. first served. If the parking lot is full, it's full. No, I don't see that. Any other questions, comments? Lake and Trailhead, for, forgive me that I do not know this, but what building is that in the... Is it just a parking lot? I couldn't tell from the There's picture no, if there was a if that was a roof or not. I think it's just the parking lot, and it okay. already exists. Okay. And it's it's paved, I believe. Yeah, it is. That one is and paved. has lines and everything. And then what are four and five? The numbers don't correlate to the images. That's London uh, London Water Tower the and Tweedy Bird. the Tweedy Bird Trail. Do we have to have two so close? Why do we need both? We really need the uh, Tweety Bird because it's the most walkable, easiest grade trail in the entire Little Sugar corridor. And the problem with it is from uh, the 
historic water tower or from the London Tower, you got to get way down the hill for, I'm, I'm mostly relating to hikers and walkers, not bikes, but it's right down there where T Tweety Bird is and it's, it's really good for hikers to have a parking space right there. The historic water tower is number seven though. That's up the hill. That's up the hill too. So why is there two so close? None of the other ones have anything that close. Just wondering why. Uh, they Limited wanted to, space? they wanted to add additional locations uh, in multiple areas, but there were areas that the board felt that were not acceptable. Um, and so, for example, at one point a year ago, there was discussion. Uh, I, I can't remember at what point a while ago. There was a discussion about having a trailhead, and you referenced this, by um, Lake Avalon Beach. And we said, no way. So there's, there's other locations that they would like to and that they proposed, and we turned them down uh, because we wanted to make sure that we did not interrupt with our property owners. Uh, for example, the, um, the Scottsdale golf cart parking lo lot that makes total sense it's not used a lot mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that makes total sense but blowing spring uh, i mean lake avalon beach would it's too busy you know we, we need every single parking spot so it made sense based upon the comments that were made to the board made by the board when we were going through these does that make sense did i answer your question i don't think so are they that close because there are limited spaces at each one of them? They would like to have, let me take a different route. They feel that seven is not a sufficient number, but that's the most that they could get. So it has nothing to do with proximity to that area. It's just number of locations available. that were workable. Okay. And would, and it, so they would like to have many more. Uh, Who, who's the they? Uh, Trailblazers, okay. NWA Trailblazers would like to have more, but I've been told, but that's the ones that were workable. They presented additional ones to us and based upon comments from the board, those additional ones were turned down. Jerry. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned Avondale. Uh, no, there's not a specific trailhead sign there. <laughs> But where they put the bridge, I mean, it comes out right square right there. So for all intents and purposes, it looks like a trailhead. Uh, I don't quite understand why that bridge had to go where it is. It'll require uh, more signs in enforcement, staff training. That's my opinion. <laughs> Okay, moving on, the next item up are bridges. Uh, good morning. I'm going to give you a little update on the two separate bridge projects we have going. The first one is for the damage that was done at Scottsdale on bridge number two and four. I want to make it clear that there wasn't damage to the bridge structures themselves. There was a compromise to the bulkheading on each end that supports the bridge. So the work will be to secure the bulkheads that the bridges are setting on for future for the safety of those bridges so we don't risk losing a bridge. Crafton and Tall has completed their steady a water flow basically uh, what that does is tells them how many cubic feet of water will go through under that bridge and impact that bridge in a certain level of flood so they can determine what is the best way and what they have to do construction wise to secure them. right now they have that number they're working on the bids uh, well, actually the construction documents of the repairs to both of those bridges once that is complete they will send that to us we will take a look at it be sure we're comfortable with it and then at that time we will go out to let the project for bidders to do the work. We anticipate the letting process based on what Kraft and Tall is telling me now to be sometime mid-March which means it takes some period of time March to get a contractor hopefully work would be done in April and be completed. I cannot tell you 
my estimate of how long the work is because I haven't seen exactly what it is they're going to do. Uh, it could be very short. If it was just riprap, it could be a little longer if they have to use stack blocks, as an example. So that's where we are at Scottsdale as far as the bridges. The other bridge that I want to talk about is the one on 18 Burksdale that we are attempting to remove. First thing I would tell you is that bridge holds a water line and a sewer line for wastewater. You probably have noticed some equipment out in the middle of that fairway. They have done a bore under the creek, the sewer department, wastewater, because that's their line. They have not tied it in on both ends. They tell me there's two to four hours worth of work once they do tie it in. They can isolate their line on that bridge right now, should for some reason they don't get it tied in before a flood would knock that off. They can turn it off. They didn't have that capability before, so that was the first thing they did. Our water line is also capable of being isolated. Currently, we are still using it. When the bridge goes down, we will eliminate that line, which will have no negative impact to the ability to water either Burksdale property because it has a pump station on that side of the creek. Kingswood has a pump station on the other side of the creek. The holdup uh, right now is the permitting requirements. We have a permit with the ADEQ. It's a $200 permit. It's very simple because the work will not be done in the creek, but when the piers are pulled out, there will be a little turbulence in the water. That's what requires ADEQ, water quality. The Wildlife and Fishery Department has been contacted to be sure that there will be no issues with us removing that bridge to anything that may be in that area of fish or outside. Uh, the one that's a little more difficult is the core. The core permit, we have a nationwide permit in place. However, we have to go through the city to see what they want us to do. And the reason for that is the city administrator is in charge of uh, monitoring what goes on within the city. And since this is in a floodplain, FEMA is involved. And the city has agreements with FEMA for insurance. So he is requiring us right now, he's requesting that we'd get a no-rise certificate that's within the core permit we already have. The issue with that is if we have to do that, they have to run a hydrology study again to see how much change is in the flow when they take the bridge out. You may think it makes common sense that if you take the bridge out, it would be less of a rise. However, this is the process that we are going under right now. Mike Taggart and myself are working with a gentleman at the city to try to get him to move a little off base on that so we won't have to provide that certificate. He has been in contact with a FEMA and I have not heard back. If he tells us we have to have that, then we will have to proceed down the lines of getting a no-rise certificate and going through a little more work and a little more time. So that is the best I can give you. So I have no estimate of when we will be able to get that bridge out because right now we're, we're working to get the proper permitting in place. These permits are not expensive. That uh, no rise, the actual permit is a couple hundred dollars. The work would, the cost would be the work if we have to go back and do the study. So that's where we are with those bridges. So Any Keith, questions? Yeah, Keith, would you use uh, Burns and McDonald's data already and they could issue a certificate? We have contacted Burns and McDonald and they they want a release on that uh, steady and we're talking about going ahead and doing that so the steady would be minimal other than the fact that they would have to put in the new numbers so it wouldn't be a complete steady to your, to your point. There will be some dollars associated but not huge. I would love to uh, get it out of there, so as soon as we can, we will. I promise you that. Next item on the agenda, policy 1.0, changing the wording uh, to activity card. I don't think we've got any questions about that. I would, I would just reiterate my suggestion that the word POA be changed to association to try to uh, basically align with the rest of the documents. Next item up, proposed wake boat regulations. 
<laughs> okay, proposed new uh, wake boat uh, regulations. Uh, the goals are to develop a regula regulations that will control the use of the wake boats on the POA lakes, balance the concerns of lakefront pro property owners with the concerns of wake boat owners, ensure that the regulation is both reasonable and enforceable. Uh, background. The Lakes Committee received uh, a number of complaints about this. They started reviewing it about two years ago in order to form re uh, recommendations that were uh, then sent to the board. The board sent it then to the Rules and Regulations Committee. Um, they developed rec uh, recommendations. The Rules and Regulations uh, Committee effectively codified it, which is what you're seeing uh, in today's packet. Uh, in order to get it on the regulations. Proposed regulation, uh, fishing and pleasure boats, uh, there would be no change. They would be required to be at 100 feet from the shoreline. Water skiing and tubing would be moved to 200 feet. Uh, wake boats would be moved to 200 feet. Right now, let me back up, right now, water skiing is at 100 feet. It would be moved to 200 feet. Weight boats are at 150 feet. They would be moved to 200 feet. In addition to that, uh, enlarged wakes created by a wedge, the wedge would have to be pointed towards the center of the lake. And I'm gonna, they, the Lakes Committee made a number of other recommendations and those are gonna be covered in just a few moments. All right, next step. It would require that it would have to go uh, to uh, the uh, next week's board meeting for a vote. It would then have to go towards uh, next month's uh, work session and then the regular meeting. I'd like to point out one thing that's included in the memo is along the way, including myself, there was multiple references to that this would be a policy and then other times we referenced the word regulation. To approve a policy requires two votes of the board, okay, at two different regular meetings. And the regular meeting is the fourth Thursday of the month. So to change a policy requires two votes. For example, the, the change, po policy change regarding the word activity on policy 1.00. This is actually a regulation. A regulation does not require two votes, but because there was some confusion along the way, including myself using the word policy multiple times, I should have been using the word regulation, we're, we're, regu we're regu uh, recommending to the board is the board take two votes on this regulation. Even though it's not required per for a regulation, since there was a lot of discussion about it and there's a little confusion, it's probably safest for the board to take two votes on the regulation even though it's not required. And all those meetings that I referenced are all open to the public meetings. Uh, Reevaluation. Re the Lake Committee have been very honest and upfront that this is not the end. Uh, this is one step in the process. Uh, they started at 200 feet. They made the recommendation to, I'm sorry, they started at 100 feet. They made the recommendation to go to 150 feet. Now their recommendation is go to 200 feet. So. This is a work in process, okay? So this is not be considered the end. Uh, they, may propose, uh, they may propose additional regulations once we've gone through an entire boating season and we've learned a lot about it. Um, also, uh, the board may stipulate further research for the Lakes Committee to conduct. Uh, some board members have talked about potentially setting, uh, having the Lakes Committee set up something to the nature of a uh, neighborhood watch. Uh, what's most frustrating for Rick Eccles and the Lakes team is when they receive a complaint and the person goes, two weeks ago there was a wake boat causing problems. Well, two weeks ago that, they can't do anything about that. If we had a neighborhood watch where they would call the lake ranger, we could address that issue immediately. Okay? And the second one is having monthly reports on how we're doing on this. Is it working? And so forth. Um, other, 
Uh, in the uh, proposed uh, budget, the revised budget that we talked about earlier, it includes that heightened amount of lake rangers that we've had uh, for multiple years at this point. There were no cuts made. When we, re when we went from the proposed um, past budget to the revised budget, there were no cuts in the number of lake rangers. We felt committed that it was important that we have enough, the, a sufficient number of lake rangers to police the lakes. And also, uh, the Lakes Committee made a number of recommendations that are not regulation type, but there are recommendations. For example, having a larger sticker on wake boats so it's easier to identify. That's, that's a recommendation that the lakes can be made, but it doesn't have to be codified into regulation. So I wanted to make sure that the additional recommendations that came from the lakes committee were not ignored, but they, are not, they do not rise to the level of a regulation. And a recap, uh, develop uh, regulations control the use of wake boats on the lake. Balance, and uh, I'm going to focus on the word balance here because it is not an easy task. I got to compliment the Lakes Committee. They're trying to balance multiple interests. Um, and w what's the great def what's the definition of a mediation when nobody is happy? Uh, unfortunately, that may be the case. Uh, Lakes Committee has, has, has really done hard, hard, a lot of good work to try and balance between multiple interests and to, tr to strike that. Uh, fairly on both sides. Uh, last thing is make sure the regulation is both reasonable and enforceable. And enforceable. Uh, at the Rules and Regulations Committee, we had Rick Eccles in attendance and Carmen Dissing. Uh, Rick Eccles is in charge of our lake staff, our lake rangers. Carmen is in charge of member services. We wanted to make sure, we wanted to get their input to make sure that anything that came down the pipe was enforceable. It may sound good on paper, but is enforceable, and they were there to, to confirm that these recommendations to the regulations are enforceable. Included in your, uh, or we have a handout, is a, revised, a proposed revised lake regulations document. It won't be in the large handout. It'll be an individual piece of paper uh, for your perusal. Tom, since it seems like we're not gonna or we don't feel confident enough to really institutionalize this change why would we not just say we're gonna try this for a year as opposed to taking two votes and then having to go through the process next year of potentially significantly changing so uh, keep in mind, so governing documents, we have the declaration and you keep on coming down, you have bylaws and policies and the higher the governing document is, uh, the more weight it, it carries, okay? One of the lower ones is a regulation, okay? A regulation, if you recall, uh, last year uh, in uh, 2018, uh, there was a number of recommended changes to the regulations that went in front of the board, they voted on it and so forth. Um, so it's not a policy, this is a regulation, it's still important, it still needs to be voted upon by the board. The only reason we're asking the board to vote twice is simply because we use the word policy multiple times. And, well, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not averse to the two votes. I'm just thinking, why even bother with the two votes at this point? I mean, a year or so ago when uh, the golf committee was looking at handicap flags, they said, we'll try this for a year before we institutionalize it. That's a good point. Why wouldn't we do the same thing with this? Uh, I think two things is, is it's been a hotly debated item for a number of years, and I think the board needs to be involved. Um, yeah. Where the, the handicap flags were not as hotly debated. I, so I think it's a, it's a hotly debated one where we received a lot of input on both sides of the fence. Uh, and second of all, we do need the board to vote to change, to amend the regulations. 
Uh, it's still a regulation, and so it requires a vote. Um, if the board did not do a vote, whether the, you know one or two votes, if they didn't do a vote, then the current regulation is in place, and the current um, regulation is 150 feet. And at this point, the, the Lakes Committee is recommending, um, and so the board approved the hundred the move from 100 feet for wake boats to 150 feet a year plus ago when they voted on it, and now they're voting again. I think. The reason why I'm saying that this is this is not the end is it, it may be the the lakes committee may come back and say, hey, we've had a really good year and the 200 feet, we nailed it. That was the right thing, or they may come back and say, it didn't work. We got to have to make additional changes. Um, I just did not want to give anybody the impression that this is the end of the process. Reevaluation doesn't necessarily mean change. But reevaluation is an important part of this. And that's one of the things that Jerry has been pointing out is, hey, we want to make sure you reevaluate the board talking to the Lakes Committee. We want to make sure the Lakes Committee continues to reevaluate this and continues to report on it. And it may be possible that you know, we don't wait to the end of the year to make changes. It's usually best to change regulations for boat use once a year because it's easier to get the information out when they register it could be that they make additional changes mid-year maybe it's really well, how, how long is the season for voting i'm just saying that that's an option okay. uh, you know we we, we, we want to give the lakes committee some some options and the more flexibility that we give the lakes lakes committee the the more decision making they can have. So I think the moral of the story, I, I've spent way too much time on this question, evaluation and change is not necessarily the same thing. They may evaluate and make additional changes, they may reevaluate re and make no changes. But let's give them that option. Sure. In my opinion. Okay, seeing no further, oh there is further comment. Right. Um, I wanted to follow up on that target. Are we still planning to codify or, or track the number of actual wake boats in Bella Vista at this point? Correct. That's one of okay. the items that is not in the regulation, but one of the recommendations from the Lakes Committee to track specifically when a person gets a, when they register their boat, we're going to provide them with the, the uh, description, you know, a boat that can take on ballast. Um, and, and that's why we had Carmen Dissing from the membership services. That's why we had her in with us at the Re Rules and Regulations Committee to make sure she was like, okay, we can do it. Our staff can do that. Sure. Uh, is there a sense that, um, is it gonna be the same sticker as all the other boats or, or was there still the decision to make uh, it larger and more identifiable? To my knowledge, the, the, the Rules and Regulations Committee has kind of gone back and forth on a bigger sticker, the same size sticker, and we haven't received an answer yet. Uh, right now, we, we did order and receive a different type of spit and sticker for wake boats. It's different. But the color's different or the, the color size? Is, or the color is different, but the size is exactly the same. And okay. so one of the discussion points at the Rules and Regulations Committee was how big should the sticker be? You make it bigger, it's more visible. You make it bigger, it may upset the boat owner because they don't want a big sticker on it. So no decision was made or recommendation was made by the Rules and Regulations Committee. So at this point, the, the management is just waiting for an answer on that. But we do have a different colored sticker specific just for uh, wake boat owners. And we have a lot of those stickers because the minimum was 250 <laughs> stickers. <laughs> Hopefully there's no date on them. Uh, uh, commenting on this uh, proposal, there's obviously no direction about the number of wake boats. Is five too many, 10, 20, 50? Um, but as you say, it'll continue to be talked about. 
the other thing here, this general regulation, um, if you read it, the, the wake boat goes about eight or nine miles an hour and it's going to be on basically the same plane at 200 feet. A uh, person skiing might be going 40 miles an hour. And then, of course, a person tubing might be going, I don't know, 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, depending on what you're trying to do. So to me, it sort of reads that uh, if there's any other boat out there on the lake that the, and maybe this was intentional, uh, but if there's any other boat out there that basically a wake boat cannot be under operation creating a large wake. You can't operate at such a speed or, to, or create your wake if you have a boat coming or going. So well, if, it's, I, I think if it's 10 feet away or 50 feet, 100 feet away or, I mean, it's I, I to me, it's pretty loosely written, and so I, think I the definitely is, look at revising it. I think the difference is, I apologize, I didn't let you finish your question. Um, I think the difference is, is under general regulation, it says hazardous wake, where under wake boats, it talks about enlarged wake. And so I think that, uh, I think there is a difference that you can, uh, you know, come up fast upon a boat, another boat that's a fishing boat standing still and come up hard and do a big turn at the last minute, that clearly would be a dangerous uh, or hazardous wake as opposed to an enlarged wake, uh, which is clarified under the wake boat section. No, that, that's good. I, there's no intention to, to limit it to one or two boats, but you, I'm not a boater. Uh, I think you can have a a, wa a, a wake boater and then the two minutes later a ski boat right behind them I I assume there, there, there was no intent to there was no intent to to diminish the number of people boats that could be out there okay uh, I mean if you're a, a skier um, you want it as smooth as possible for as long as possible straight as possible uh, so you know the definition of hazardous is just pretty nebulous Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's de it's definitely a you know just like uh, the statute says you're you're responsible for your own wake you know damage caused by your own wake if it's a uh, hazardous then it's that's another it's a, yeah that raises another not point. very objective criteria for sure yeah and I don't know if it can be tightened or maybe that's just going to be another issue um, did we change anything on the liability situation no. Is there no feeling that perhaps we should at least educate people that you are responsible for your wake, whether it's a fishing boat, a bass boat, or a pontoon, or a wake boat? Well, I just wanted to make it clear, and it, it, it's, it's listed in, or it's covered in this memo, but uh, this uh, regulation was developed consistent with the recommendations from the Lakes Committee. And so we limited this to their recommendations. Now, if the board decides to, to deviate from that, you know, that's another thing, but this was de developed in that regard. Right, um, because the industry standard on at least deeper wakes is 250 foot setback. So um, good to hear that the board can make some suggestions and changes. Jerry. That look. <laughs> um, I just really would like to make it clear that uh, to echo what Tom has said, uh, we're not done. Uh, this is a, a midpoint in here. We don't have enough data at the current time to really make a solid decision. Are things actually damaging things? Are people actually getting hurt, we hear the stories, but we don't have the hard data. Um, I will be asking uh, through Tom and the chair and so on, the board to uh, uh, authorize the Lakes Committee to continue their, their work. 
uh, to set up the Lake Watch program uh, where people can take pictures of offending waves that come in, uh, call a lake ranger immediately to where we can get some good hard data as to what is happening. Uh, that will then lead to uh, possibly carrying capacities of the lakes uh, for the various boats, various numbers of people. Uh, that takes some effort to do that. Uh, it will also lead to uh, the size of boat that can be handled upon a lake, uh, the maximum speed that could be used. All of those kinds of things uh, would come out of some data that we can generate over this next summer uh, coming in. Uh, you know, we, we hate to just make decisions uh, quickly, uh, and this hasn't been a quick dec decision this far. Uh, I, I think the uh, current regulation, the way it is written, is uh, a, a good start, uh, if nothing else. And the other thing what I'd like to say is uh, Rick Yorman of the Lakes Committee is here. Is that a time for Rick to make any comment or later? Did you have anything you wanted to say, Rick? Uh, I would like to make one comment. First of all, I appreciate the board uh, taking our recommendations, and that looks like where you're headed. On the handout, proposed regulations, under wake boats, item three. Um, it says, when operating a watercraft with the intention of creating a large wake, if the watercraft is using a wedge or other device. So I want to point out, wakeboard operators typically use ballast, and they'll use it to one side. So uh, they don't just necessarily use a wedge or other device. They'll just use ballast. They'll put a water, water on one side. So I want to make sure, I wonder if there's a chance to clarify that by adding the word ballast after wedge. So Doug, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little concerned that it's not just the device. We want them to throw their wake uh, inboard to the lake, regardless of whether they're doing it with the device or just ballast. Okay. So you'd like something along the lines of, you know, when creating a directional wake to Th one side, it should be thrown to the center of the lake. Yes. So if you're doing a directional wake, it goes left. Yes, and the worst offender is when they're operating at a slow speed with the intention of surfing, they typically or almost always put it to one side, whether it's ballast or a device or something. Rick, did you see the... Did you see the, Rick, did you see the um, definition that's immediately below and would be incorporated into the regulation? The definition of a wake boat includes, but not limited to, da 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 da. It uh, gets down <clears throat> to where the heck is uh, rubberized plastic or metal tanks. Okay. Yes, I read it. It looks good. As a matter of fact, it tends to cover what I'm talking about, regardless. But right, and that one paragraph three, it tends to talk about direction. We'll, wanna, we'll, we'll have Doug re-look at that because I, I guess where I'm going with is this definition may provide a sufficient amount of clarity to yes. item three that you don't need to make a change I, to item three. I wouldn't argue with that. It, but it we'll, well. we'll let the lawyer yeah. make that decision. I don't have anything else. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Next item on the agenda. A discussion involving uh, regarding the community involvement JAC anybody here lays on to that committee want to speak oh no go ahead I'll I'll just I'm Janet Conboy I'm one of the uh, committee members and just to provide you all some context I'd love to say, first of all, that, you know, Mary and Steve and Tia have been great um, supporters and I think provided great guidance to the committee, but we'd come to a point where we have 
had difficulty maintaining a quorum and being able to pull more numbers of the community in to the committee. And part of that uh, in, in our deliberations had to do with some real confusion about, well, what are we doing? Why are we here? Uh, the information, fortunately, that was provided, Tammy provided us a copy with the bylaws that gave us a description of the committee, seemed to focus on volunteerism. There was a great discussion around, oh my gosh, Bella Vista is all about volunteerism. And is there something that we can add to that? Another piece of the discussion was around events and perhaps we need to expand the number of events we support. That again goes back to, um, I guess I would say manpower in a sense, you know, the ability of the committee to uh, generate enough volunteers and enough involvement and provide enough support itself to create more events. Lots of opportunities out there for events, but there's also issues around, you know, the, the POA staff being able to take on more support of uh, any events that we would generate. And in fact, would some of our um, identified activities really fall within or across the purview of the Recreation Committee? So we've been kind of at this, trying to revise a mission statement and come to some understanding, and we're simply not at, a, at we're simply at a point where a we need direction from the board regarding what your expectations are, what what mission indeed that you see for us, and two whether or not there's really a point for the committee to be institutionalized, to be formalized um, since the two events, the coat drive and the uh, fireflies and tailgates are already primarily uh, staffed by POA staff. Now, you know, we have a lot of good participation, you know, uh, John Bowen and Tia Bidwell did done a lot around fireflies and ta tailgates and you know, uh, other uh, possibilities, well, the movie, a movie night. But we just really need to hear from you. You know, do we, do we just say, let it go, you know, be involved in what other committee activities there, there may be other, of other committees, or um, give us some very specific direction that we can, um, work with. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Um, any of the liaisons? Tom? I, I did want to let the board know that I've been in communication with uh, Dylan Shattuck, the chair of the uh, committee, to let him know that this would be an item of discussion. Uh, and uh, he was understanding and he was very relieved uh, when uh, he found out that the management, uh, the staff would take on the, uh, fully take on the fireflies and the coat drive. Those are both valuable um, events or projects, efforts that were, you know, initiated by this committee and we would continue to, we see the value in those, both of those events and we would want to continue with them. Okay. The committee has been around, I believe, for about three years and in three years hasn't gained any kind of traction. Um, the, to Tom's point, the, the two events predominantly are run by POA senior staff already, so they would definitely not go away. I'm in favor of disbanding the group and um, moving those two events officially under the POA because I, I think that there are more employees within the POA who would want to get involved in volunteering for those. For the coat drive, we uh, the senior staff took it on as, as kind of their uh, charitable group, charitable event. 
uh, and uh, so we you know spent some uh, time the entire group went in and uh, put all the um, coats on hangers ranged the, the the store if you want to call it that and then uh, Kathy from recreation and, and a lot of her crew were uh, very involved in making sure that the donations bin donation bins were all over the place and collecting oh, yeah. it um, I mean the committee did a lot of work uh, but uh, if it was a situation where the POA would take it on 100% I don't see a problem with that I think it's a good thing to have a charitable event that the team can pull up, can rally around oh, yeah. yeah yeah I completely agree with Mary we have tried we have marketed everywhere we possibly can we have begged for volunteers we have asked for members to come in every marketing piece possible we've been in and it's just it didn't get anywhere the two events are going to continue which is fantastic but I do think that the community involvement group does need to be disbanded for now if there's a large group of members somewhere sitting out there listening that want to help please do now this is your last chance right and I'd uh, basically just third all the, the comments um, so. what's the process to do that Tom it's uh, the committees uh, is in our governing documents so what would end up happening is what my recommendation would be is that uh, we formally okay we're disbanding the committee inform the committee members uh, and we spoke earlier and offering them if they would like to continue to volunteer and help the community um, maybe maybe they could some of them or all of them could transfer to you know the recreation committee or what have you um, and so the meetings would then stop and then it would be pushed to the rules and regulations committee and the rules and regulations committee would have to go in and change uh, the governance uh, to eliminate that Paul that committee um, formally but informally you could do it immediately and then formally it would take you a couple months to get it done okay. can we informally just not have meetings for a year I mean without formally taking it out of our governing documents who knows a year from now we might have a whole new generation of people that want to just come and volunteer absolutely uh, in our governing documents for better or for worse we have the uh, we still have the super committee in there uh, I think it's under a different name a strategic planning committee and, and that has not met in in a long time so you could say uh, hey you know you don't have to meet any longer but we're gonna keep it on the books just as a just in case we want to recreate it down the road uh, totally acceptable um, although the policies do state that they have to meet on a regular basis so the board would be consciously saying it's okay for you to not meet for a year I think it would be cleaner to remove it and if you want to recreate it down the road just recreate it at that time but it, it's it's not a critical issue so I think you can make an argument to go either way possible to vote some kind of inactive status or something like that is it any I think you're better off research? removing it from the books uh, because uh, I mean it's one thing when the uh, golf committee takes a month off during the winter time uh, technically uh, that might be in violation of the policy yeah. but a y entire year is a whole nother thing um, and you know if we're if we're not going to do anything with the uh, super committee I think that should also be removed uh, because I would hate for a property owner brand new property owner to come up to the board and say hey I really like this idea about the super committee when's the next meeting well we haven't had a meeting in over a year and we don't have one scheduled uh, I same thing could be said about the community involvement hey I want to join the community involvement uh, we canceled that and we haven't had a meeting but it's still in the governing documents so I, I think it's best to remove it yeah. but okay. but I'm not gonna I I think it's best to remove it too for a different reason if if we bring it back I think we have to work on describing what it is we want them to do it started out as one thing and then morphed into another thing and and neither of them have caught on and and not not that I'm eulogizing 
the committee, <laughs> but I do want to point out they created these two events. Also, when it was the Young Residents Committee, which was the predecessor to the community involvement, they were behind um, uh, the beach and they were behind re uh, the renovation of all the uh, play to playground equipment. So I want to I want to recognize the the effort that this committee has done uh, over the years, and and not let that be lost uh, because with without that initial committee and the and the spur that they gave, we we potentially wouldn't have a beach, and we potentially wouldn't have new playground equipment. So I guess we pretty well see the handwriting on the wall there. Uh, we will proceed. Next item is a report on an executive session, a summary from the meeting on February 13th. I have a statement that I will read. <clears throat> Eight property owners filed similar allegations of misconduct against Chairperson Hatcher for allegedly overstepping her authority by directing management to prepare a proposed budget update for 2020, which purportedly violated policy 1.10, item 11, and bylaws article 3, section 4. The alleged misconduct occurred on January 23rd. It was determined by the board that there was no misconduct since Chairperson Hatcher directed management to prepare only a draft version of a proposed revised budget. It was stated in the January 23rd meeting that the board would have to vote to adopt a new budget. The draft version of the budget was simply preparatory work to enable the board to take a vote. Also, prior to the January 23rd meeting, the board had discussed on a number of occasions that the budget would have to be revised if the assessment increase was approved. The board of directors voted unanimously to dismiss the allegation of misconduct. Director Hover was unable to attend the meeting. Chairperson Hatcher was not in attendance for the vote. Next item on the agenda is the open forum. Three minutes, please. David. I have to leave you. I have a dental appointment that I can't miss. Oh, have fun. No. Everybody loves the dentist. <laughs> Susan. Hi, Susan Nuttall, Forty Pimlico. Uh, I'm going to make a couple brief comments about the trails and then I'm going to talk about Burksdale. I would suggest that before you vote on the trailheads, you get in a car and drive it and find out where they are. Because the three you're talking about, in fact, are very close together, but there's ones at the bottom of a holler, ones at the top of a holler, ones at the top of another holler, and different trails come into those areas. You get a very different perspective on those. Okay, uh, the Metfield Connector, we're avid bikers. We ride that on the road all the time. It's a wonderful ride. It's very manageable, and the little bit that is a little steeper is um, barely anything from a walking perspective. On a bike, you just gear down one. Uh, it's right up at the end of the of the trail, and it's a wonderful trail, and it uh, it just connects so many people to this incredible um, trail we have further down uh, in the valley, and it's it's just such a wonderful thing. So I encourage you on that. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is Burksdale. Uh, at the golf committee last week, uh, it was announced that Burksdale was opening. Um, which kind of took me by surprise a little bit. but And I want to let you know, first of all, I love Burksdale. I applaud the efforts of the staff to come up with a way to even open it, to even consider opening it. Um, and I think they did a good job with that. But the process was kind of weird because we were told it was an announcement, no input from the community, no discussion in the meeting. That's what the committee was told going into the meeting which is completely opposite of what we've had before, especially with Burksdale. Um, but we talked anyway. Um, my concern is that I think the business case for it in general is very weak. Uh, there are five points usually you look at, uh, and on all four, five points the business case is weak. And I think part of the issue is that implementation of it will not achieve the objectives. Okay. So the first 
question you ask, is it going to maintain or improve our brand? Uh, the reality is no, because it's going to be a substandard course. We are not going to encourage guests to play there, and we have to tell members that it is not up to the standards where we expect. And to be honest, we're spoiled because they put out a really great product. <laughs> okay, so now we're going way back. Um, secondly is the safety issues. Uh, I don't know if you have actually gotten in a golf cart and rode up and down that hill. Uh, if you haven't, you need to do that because it also is very steep. If two carts meet, there could be a very serious accident. Um, and also now there's cross traffic at the bottom of the trail because of the, of the hiking trail. So uh, that's also an issue that was not there last year. Um, thir thirdly, um, the benefit case. What are we expecting? Uh, I mean... Sorry, Susan. Um, just to let you know, <laughs> The, eight, or the women's nine hole that's supposed to play there, we can't play our whole group there. Our group will be split because we can't play on, Ber the whole group can't play on Burksdale. So, uh, and also you're not saving $49,000. <laughs> Hi, Sandy Fosdick, 37 Stonehaven Drive. Um, I want to thank you members who are taking a closer look at the extension of the trail system before moving forward. I think the last thing that we need is for the POA to get sued and be involved in another lawsuit. Um, there were also three to 400 people that came out wanting to keep Brittany Golf Course open. I am still concerned about the liability of putting that sidewalk um, uh, next to the second and third hole. Um, I know you said that the maps have been out for a long time. Well, the maps that we've had available, to me, it appears as if the bike trail is going down the middle of the road. And I had coffee with the city council member this week, and what he indicated was that the city can't dictate what we do on private property, meaning we the POA. So that tells me that we the POA are the ones that have given these parcels to the city to approve or disapprove. And it's my understanding that at one time, again, visiting with the city, and I don't know because this stuff is done behind closed doors, that there were in fact two options. One of putting the trail on the other side, which would keep it away from Brittany Golf Course. I've never seen a map of that. So, I mean, I'd like to see that. I'd like for members to be able to consider things. They say that the population in Bella Vista is going to double in the next 30 years. We can't control how many trees are cut down because people are putting up homes. And I think that just makes it more important that we pay attention to what we're doing with our common property. Members should have a say. No, we can't vote on everything, but we just mailed out two ballots. Why couldn't this issue have been put in with those things? My opinion, we can vote on more than one thing at a time. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Why are you so short? <laughs> <clears throat> Michael McCracken, One Winter Circle. Um, first, I know we were talking about the budget. <clears throat> I find it a little disturbing that you can't find $12,000 to fix a dog park, but golf can get $412,000. One thing that, uh, with all the belt tightening and we got to cut back and all this, I never saw any, I never heard of any uh, discussion about cutting back on salaries and wages, which have increased over $1.8 million in three years. A 20% cutback on salaries and wages <clears throat> would be $260,000. Uh, also, the archery was mentioned that wasn't going to be funded, and during the Recreation Committee, they mentioned that uh, they approached Cooper to see if they would give us some land. Cooper said, yeah, we'd be glad to do that at fair market value. And yet, we've given away 400 acres for $10. Uh, whoever came up with that deal needs to go back to business school because um, 
not only did we give away our land, then we agreed to give them $70,000 to maintain it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Timing of this is a little suspect. Two months ago in the city council meeting, it was mentioned that uh, Mr. Judson was going to wait till now to bring this up to the board. And yet in all these discussions, it says it's been talked about since 2000, 2006, <clears throat> 2012. Why wait till after the assessment vote to bring it up? Uh, I think it should have been brought up well before this. Uh, on the trailhead, somebody mentioned well, in your presentation, you said only 200 feet or over a 5% grade. People need to understand what a grade is. 6% is dangerous. And what about the other 15,000 feet? Just because it's under 5% doesn't mean it's not at 4% <clears throat> or 3%. People have said they read uh, Road to Greenway. And yeah, uh, Crystal Bridges Hill is hard. It's nothing compared to what Bella Vista will have. If people think young families are going to get on their bicycles and take their 10-year-old kids to the store, pick up groceries, and ride home, they're sadly mistaken. As an experiment, I did a, I took my vehicle to the top of the hill just above uh, Cooper on Manchester, put it in neutral, and it's not even an eighth of a mile down in the road. I was doing 40 miles an hour, and that's a 5% grade by my math. Go on to Google, research grades, 5% uh, grade is a lot. Uh, let's see. Oh, mentioning no maintenance costs. It's just a sidewalk. Well, it's not just a sidewalk. Look at uh, the greenway between Bella Vista Lake and Walgreens. It's been closed for months due to erosion. When you ride the greenway between here and Fayetteville, crews are out there all the time taking Thank limbs. you for your time. Thank You're you welcome. Coming. Thank you for your time. Anybody else? Anyway, I'm Bonnie Dove from Lake Windsor, and I have some great concerns. It's okay. I can talk loud. I have some great concerns about the two speedboats that zoom up and down recklessly our lake, uh, and also the fact that basically the board, the rules and regs, the lake committee is basically not listening to the residents of Lake Windsor. I'm concerned about child safety or even adult safety more than I am the seawall. And the way the speedboats go up and down, a little head bobbing out of the water would never be seen in time for them to change their course of action or slow their boat down. I've talked to members, and the one excuse I get is, well, you can't change people's behavior. And that's about as worthless as the enlarged stickers not being started because people may be upset. The other thing is I think we should <clears throat> make suggestions that even the police get involved. Since it is reckless boating, you are endangering a person's life. And if the rangers can't act and get the people to behave, as is stated to me, that basically you bring in the police to account for it. But my concern, more than anything, is on page 8 to 12 of the Rules and Bregs when we had the, the meeting <clears throat> a couple weeks ago. There was no attempt whatsoever to listen to the members of Lake Windsor and to initiate any of the suggestions. I also am asking you to reconsider the 200 foot and make it 300 foot. If you do your due diligence, you'll see that 200 foot is not going to be appropriate for the lake. Thank you. Okay, um, open forum is done. Tom, you respond. 
Uh, a couple items. Uh, we did this at the last uh, regular meeting, and I was uh, cornered by a number of uh, property owners and board members that felt that this would, it made sense to, uh, well, the property owners come up and make comments. It's not necessarily a discussion, but it is important that uh, we have some closure, at least on some of the easier items. So what I've done is I've taken some notes, and, and I'd like to make a couple comments. Um, uh, Susan's comment about uh, uh, Burksdale, um, I have a feeling that uh, knowing Keith, he's going to do everything he can to maintain that course as to the best of his ability. Um, I also want to point out, and, and, I, and I know you're not, you were not taking a pot shot at Keith in any way. I understand oh, that. Anyway. And I, I, um, we did receive uh, calls immediately after the meeting from uh, the, the president and the vice president of the ladies nine hole. And they felt it was very important. They, their opinion, they really want to have uh, events at Burksdale North when it opens. Um, uh, regarding the comment on multiple plans on uh, the Blowing Springs connector and their plans uh, for the trail to be on the east side, I personally have never heard nor seen any plans of that nature. I can't give you something I don't have and have never heard or never heard heard verbally about or seen personally. Um, uh, the dog park, it, you know, I, I'm uh, not trying to downplay that. Uh, the board had a tough decision to make. They had to make hard decisions and not, uh, and, and those were uh, some of them. Yeah, the, exactly. They, they talked at length about um, archery, um, uh, pickleball and the dog park the, that consumed a lot of time and it was just a hard decision that they had to make um, you know it's 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 not all glamour being on the board it, it can be hard uh, regarding archery uh, early on the conversation uh, was uh, with the CCI about leasing the land and it looked optimistic uh, they have had a change in leadership and they we're no longer willing to lease the land, only sell the land, and, and that's uh, given how close it is to the bypass, I have a feeling that the appraised value is, is not going to be something that is affordable. Um, speed boats, you know, anytime a boat is speeding, uh, I encourage everybody to call the Lake Rangers immediately. Uh, I referenced this earlier, there's nothing more frustrating when we find out about an incident two weeks ago or three weeks ago and there's really nothing we can do but if we find out about a, someone that's violating the rules immediately we can dispatch someone that, to get there and address the issue immediately um, and the last thing and, and, and I'm gonna steal someone's someone's words um, I would say that the Lakes Committee and the board and the Recreation Committee has listened to our to, to the members about uh, their concerns, the residents of Lake Windsor, they absolutely have listening and agreeing are not the same thing um, and trying to strike that delicate balance. Uh, but uh, I commend the Lakes Committee. They've been a very open-minded and listened to a lot of people. Um, in some cases, the uh, points of view have been very divergent. Um, and once again, not a very easy job for a volunteer group. Okay, thank you. Uh, the announcements. Rules and Regulations Committee, Wednesday, February 26th, 4.30, right here in this boardroom. Board of Directors regular session, Thursday, week from today, 6 p.m. in Reardon Hall. Let's change in location. We anticipate there may be large numbers of people who are interested in the outcome. Coffee and Questions is Tuesday, March 10th, 10 a.m. at Metfield Clubhouse this time. Board of Directors General Managers Meeting, Thursday, March 12th, 4.30, right here. Closed meeting. Uh, meet the Candidates Night, Tuesday, March 17th, 6 p.m. at Reardon Hall. Board of Directors Work Session, Thursday, March 19th, 9 a.m., right here. And Board of Directors regular session for March will be Thursday the 26th, 6 p.m. right here. 
If there are no, no objections, we will adjourn.